first minute and a half or so. Um, within an hour of me posting it, there was a message from someone not in this class that says, hey, there's no audio on this, you know. So it's just amazing how quick, and, and I, I responded back, you know, actually, you know, the 90 seconds in, the audio starts, I just forgot to, to, to turn the mic on, but it's just amazing when you put stuff out there, how, how uh, uh, people, you know, people find it, you know, and I have a lot of subscribers, and, and a, you know, from around the world, and it, it's kind of cool, it's kind of fun, so uh, if, if you are a, uh, <laughs> if you are a subscriber, or you watch these videos, I also saw someone in the, in the United Kingdom uh, watching one of my videos was an assignment for uh, uh, their class. So they had a class in, in, I think it was in database design, and, and, and they were assigned to watch the videos. So hey, you know, you put these out there. So greetings. If you, uh, if you are watching and you're not enrolled in one of my classes, feel free to drop me a line and say hi. I, I you know, I shouldn't, I probably shouldn't let this go to my head, you know, I'm going to, you know, uh, uh, eventually, you know, I'll have a makeup person in here and, you know, the, and the whole bit and, and, and music going on, like a band, like, like, uh, like uh, Letterman or whatever, I'll have like a little Paul Schaefer over there in the corner, but yeah, drop me a line and say hi, email address is this, and Students are welcome to drop me a line, too. <laughs> in fact, students should be dropping me lines uh, when, they, when, they need, uh, uh, when they need help with something. All right. At any rate, um, today uh, we're going to continue on our discussion of design. And we are going to, uh, we're going to start with the assumption that we kind of concluded class with last time. And then we're going to build on it. Because... We came up with a conclusion, and we're going to add a little bit to that, and then we're going to refine it and be more specific. All right. Um, the statement that, that I ended class with was something along the lines of, a well-designed website is a site where the user can easily um, achieve goals. I'm going to add one more line to it um, that's important. And that also, that helps the organization achieve goals. A software company could develop a website where, where customers could download all their software for free and that would achieve the user's goals, but that wouldn't achieve the organization's goals, right? So hopefully there's enough overlap in there between the organization's goals and the uh, user's goals where uh, both can be addressed. Let's think of it if you're talking about a software company, if you're talking about a company that makes games, let's say. How could um, the user goal, of course, is to enjoy themselves and to have fun. All right. The organization's goal includes to sell more stuff and to get more customers. What's well, something that a video game maker could put on their site that would both address the goals of the user and address the goals of the organization? Yes. Okay. Well, one thing is, is they, they might offer a, um, a demo version of the game that is uh, less features. And you notice that a lot like in mobile development. They'll be like the, uh, you know, the free Angry Birds and the premium Angry Birds. All right. Someone else have? Yeah. Uh, feedback and for new Right. Content. Feedback and requests for content. That, that would uh, allow customers to have a voice and to express things that they're having an issue with 
And that's also valuable information for the organization. All right? Yes. Some, some tournaments online. Yeah. Uh, tournaments online would be fun for the, the people involved. And it gets more people playing their game, so it's good for the organization too. All right? So the idea is, is you, you know, you're looking for a win-win situation. You know, if you only address the needs of the organization and you only build the website for your organization, then, then eh, you know, who's going to want to use it? Uh, on the other hand, of course, the, the goals of the organization are important and they need to be addressed too. All right? So this is what we're, we're starting out as our assumption of a well-designed website. This is, this is my definition of a well-designed website. A site where the users can easily achieve their goals and it helps the organizations achieve their goals. All right? So it's all about goals. It's all surrounding goals. Now notice how this might be a different definition of what a layperson, you know, someone that, that hasn't studied this or, or, or saw a casual view, viewer of a web uh, m might say this. You know, um, They'll say something is a well-designed site, maybe, in some cases, if it looks nice, if there's great pictures on it, if, uh, if the, the colors are nice and pleasing and it's laid out in a way that uh, looks, looks good. All right? We want to move away from the focus of defining a website based on how it looks and define a, a well-designed website based on how it acts. And, and, and how people can use it and how easily people can use it. All right? That doesn't mean that the appearance doesn't matter. It's just that the appearance sort of takes a back seat to these other issues. The appearance comes into play too. Of course you want the website to look good. You know, that promotes a professional appearance for your organization. And people like looking at nice things more than they like looking at uh, you know, things that, that aren't, aren't so visually appealing. All right. So, of course, those things are important, but they're important to the degree that they help the users achieve their goals. All right. That's where the importance lies. So, again, we're not discounting the appearance. We're just saying that's not what's driving this. All right. So, um, we need to be a little more specific, though. All right. Yeah, achieve their goals. That's uh, a nice... Uh, a nice statement, but um, what are some of the things that, that you can do when developing a site to help the user achieve their goals? What are some visual aspects and, and other sort of aspects of the design of a website that allows us to create a website that achieves the goals of the organization and helps the user achieve their goals? What are some of the things we can do? Yes? Okay. The use of white space, all right? Now, you use the term white space even when you're not per se, not the color white. I mean, if, if, there's, if the background is like a, a beige, you, know, you don't call it beige space, you still call it white space, all right? Uh, so, Maybe a better way to phrase this is empty space. Another way to say it is have stuff that is not cluttered. What's bad with having the stuff cluttered on the page? I mean, we, we, get, we got the idea that cluttered is bad, but why is cluttered bad? It's hard to find everything, right? When everything is, is smashed together, then it's hard to differentiate between what's navigation and what isn't navigation. What is one article, what is another article, and so on down the line. Um, is anyone aware of a site that is cluttered? Can anyone think of one? Yes. <laughs> I think I've seen this one. What, what is, uh, a, lot of these, a lot of these sites are perennial favorites of, of, of this class and um, they must like appear towards the top of the list of like when you do a, a search for bad websites. What was the name of it again? Len, L-E-N? L-I-N-S.
Yeah, I will. Wow, if this isn't it, it also deserves it. Anyone that has sunglasses, you might want to put them on. All right. Anyone prone to seizure, you might want to put them on because there's some blinking going on here. Or you might divert your eyes. Is this the one? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Look at that. Look at all that's going on here. You know, for one thing, it's very cluttered. Um, you actually can sort of see the navigation, but like everything down here... <laughs> sort of blends together. There doesn't appear to be any sort of no, uh, uh, organization of this. There's just a big chunk of data. It might be going from less expensive to most expensive. and so on. Goes on forever and it's long and stuff is smashed together and uh, again. I live inside this website. Yeah. Monday. And there's a lot going on as far as blinking and a lot of stuff to distract you. You know, your eyes don't even really know where to focus. This car that's about ready to explode. Uh, <laughs> Any number of things that are blinking. Where is that? This? Yeah. I am tempted to click on live. <laughs> yeah. So. There's just so much going on on this that there's hard, uh, you're, you're hard pressed to focus on anything. All right? You're hard pressed to find something that your eyes can look at and get a sense of, of everything there. So what's wrong with clutter is that everything tends to blend together. Right? So that's why books, newspapers, magazines, they put some space. That space is there to help you visually organize the material. All right? In other words, if I had, let's see this. Here's an advertisement I got the other day. Put it on there. All right. You could, you could, you could blur your eyes, or if you have glasses, you could take off your glasses, and you could see that. We have two distinct articles here. And the whole thing is bigger, so th th there's, there's more of this you know, going in both directions. But you could see at a glance, if you were to look at this, how many articles are on this page without even like, really like reading the material. All right? Because it isn't smashed together. There's space between the articles. There's space between the headline and the text. There's space around the pictures and so on. And that white space isn't just there for, you know, uh, just to be there. It actually helps you organize the content in the page. So a lack of clutter, white space, allows you to organize uh, the material that is on the page. It makes it more readable as well. All right? And this is, this is important for everyone. It's especially important for people that um, don't have the best vision or people that are dyslexic. Uh, to have a sufficient space between things helps them distinguish the letters. All right. So, again, it looks more attractive this way. I would argue that this looks a whole lot better than Ling's site. All right. But it's not just about the fact that it looks better. I think it looks nicer. It's about the fact that I'm able to look at this material and get a grasp of what the structure is 
even without reading it, whereas Ling's, I have to stare at it and, and try to figure out what's going on. What's another uh, quality of a good website? So we said having uh, empty space or white space is one good quality. Good navigation. All right, that's up there on the list to be sure, all right? In fact, most of the time, if you hear people complain about what, why a site is bad, they'll, they'll make a statement in one form or the other, something like, I can't find what I'm looking for on the site, in, in essence, when you boil it down, all right? You might know it's there, but you can't find it. In fact, that's sort of the mantra of web designers that don't have a clue, or only half have a clue, all right? If someone complains about their website, I, and I've heard people do this, they'll say something to the effect of, people complain about our website, they can't find the customer feedback form. Well, we have a customer feedback form on there. Well, yeah, you have it on there. There is a needle inside that haystack, all right? The question is, is if people can't find it, it's as good as not being there, right? Or if it's a struggle or, or whatever, all right? Remember, on the web, if people can't find something on your site, there's a real good chance that they could go to another site and find it quickly, all right? You know, let's say I am shopping in a hardware store. Let's say I'm in Lowe's and I'm looking for something. All right, uh, I'm looking for um, a particular kind of light bulb. All right, if I can't find it in Lowe's, if I drove to Lowe's, it's raining out, all right, and I got drenched from the parking lot to, to Lowe's and I'm in there. If I can't find it, there's sort of motivation for me to be a little persistent, right? Because I'm already there. I drove there, I'm not savoring the possibility of getting in my car and driving to Home Depot and get out, getting soaked again in the parking lot and looking through there. So, if I can't find it in Lowe's immediately, I might be a little persistent. All right? I may walk up and down the same aisle five times. Uh, not that I've actually done this, but I have actually done this, so, <laughs> all right? Uh, I might look around, I might, you know, walk up and down the aisle, I might do a lot of things. The point is, is there's motivation for me being persistent because there is a bit of a chore for me to go somewhere else, right? It, it, it's going to take a fair amount of effort to get me somewhere else, and I'm already there, I might as well find it. Do you have that sort of similar constraint on a website? Absolutely not. If you go on Lowe's website, for example, and you're having trouble with the navigation and you can't find this, that, or the other, ah, forget this, I'm going to go to Sears Hardware or Home Depot or whatever and find it. So that's a very common complaint among sites. You know, if you think, and again, if we phrase how good a site is defined as the users can easily achieve their goals, Part of achieving their goals is finding the stuff on your site that's going to help them achieve their goals. And therefore, good navigation becomes critical. All right. So I think certainly no one's going to argue that bad navigation is good. All right. Good navigation, of course, is good. That's why they call it good navigation. All right. But what makes something good navigation versus bad navigation? What are some characteristics of good navigation? Yes. Consistent. Okay. Yeah, let's do one at a time. First of all, consistent. All right. Consistency can be described a couple ways. All right. The same spot on the same uh, on on each page. And again, maybe not literally every page. All right. For example, it's it's sort of common to have the home page look one way and every other page look a different way. All right, so it doesn't literally have to be every single page having the exact same layout, but consistency, all right? So pages having the navigation in the same place, that's part of it. Having it look the same, all right, that's another part of it. Um, 
that's another aspect of consistency. Calling the same thing by the same terms is an aspect of consistency. All right. Um, I'll give you a for instance. Uh, in, in a company that I used to work for, we did uh, software for food, uh, for, for people in the food business, all right, for actually food brokers. And it was very confusing because sometimes people would refer to the people that make food as manufacturers, right, because they manufacture food. Other times they would refer to people that make the food as principles, all right. They're the principles, you know, they're, they're the people that the food brokers essentially are working for, so they're their principles, all right? Now, if I developed a website for my organization that was selling software in the food brokerage business, if I call them manufacturers in one place and principles in another place for my navigation, I'm apt to confuse, all right, people, all right? Um, maybe people in the industry would get it. Maybe not. You know, depending on the context, I'm, I'm liable to, to uh, confuse them. All right. Um, you could probably point to a lot of different uh, uh, instances of that, where there's, there's things that could be referred to by a couple different names. Well, for your navigation, pick one and stick with it. And anytime you link to it, use that term. All right. So consistency in appearance, consistency in language is important. Um, Someone else had another characteristic of a good navigation. Um, in the back? Yeah, multiple ways of getting somewhere. Within reason. All right. Um, it's great, for example, when sites have a search capability, right? Because on the odd chance, if you can't quite figure out their navigation scheme, you can um, just put in some uh, a search term and, and find it if the search is, is effective. So that would be one example of two different ways to get to the same thing. One would be through the regular navigation. One would be through the, uh, through the search. Another thing is, is sometimes uh, uh, an organization, um, like for example, uh, eBay. If you go to eBay, you can sort the, if you do a search for something, you can sort the auctions by um, uh, most expensive to least expensive, or least expensive to most expensive, or the auctions that are closest to uh, uh, you know, expiring or, or whatever. In other cases, you can see products may be listed by manufacturer, or you can see products listed by category, or whatever. So, in general terms, it's good to give some options there, because people might be viewing things a different way. You know, people might have slightly different goals. Two people shopping for the same product might be, um, might have slightly different goals, all right? Um, Someone, for example, looking for golf clubs on a website. You could have, uh, you know, if you compare the experience of a experienced golfer with a novice golfer, they're going to have slightly different goals. The experienced golfer probably is looking for something very specific and, you know, probably a higher end kind of uh, golf clubs. Whereas a novice might just like say, well, gee, if I wanted to start out, what could I get? So if you have a couple different ways to get to the same material, that can be very useful. Now, I put in there, in parentheses, within reason. Why do you suppose I put that in there? Well, because we're reasonable people. But if choice is good, is more choice better? And the answer is no. Uh, uh, paradoxically, no. You might think, gee, it's great to have choices, you know. When you have too many choices, there's, the, you know, that. I've heard the term, the psychological term, the paralysis of choice, all right? You're not really sure where to go. It's, it's amazing, for example, when you go to the supermarket and shop for cat food. Do you know how many kinds of cat food there are? There's a lot of different kinds of cat food, all right? 
If you go shopping for olive oil, there's a lot of different kinds of olive oil. You pick anything that you can think of, and you might think, yeah, paper towel, I'll get some paper towels. Well, wait a minute, what kind of paper towels do you want? Do you want the organic paper towels? Do you want the brawny paper towels? Do you want the two-ply? Do you want... There's so many choices sometimes that, you know, when I go grocery shopping, I'll like just slack-jawed be staring at the shelf for a long time. Now, people can have a similar sort of thing on websites. If you provide too many options and too many different ways of going at things, that actually kind of gets into the clutter and kind of gets into the overkill and having too much. So, one of the things about design is when you, when you design something and the whole act of web designing, oftentimes it is balancing two opposite forces. All right? Um, and very often you'll see those opposite forces are, uh, are just different names for simplicity versus complexity. For example, a, uh, if there was just one way to navigate the site, that'd be real simple. But that might not be good. If you had a million ways to navigate the site, that would be very complex and that would give a lot of options, but that wouldn't be good. Chances are you can find a sweet spot somewhere in between that is a perfect combination of simplicity to make it easy for people and complexity where people can do things a lot of different ways or, or do a lot of different things. Okay. You, um, well, you promised you were going to press the yeah, button so here that I am. people in, in cyberspace would know you. So. So maybe I'll be famous in okay, the there UK you go. now too. Um, I was reading, and this may be getting a little ahead, but I was reading how people scan pages in an F pattern. Mm -hmm. And I thought if you have too much navigation, if you have a navigation across the top, they see your title, your navigation, and if you have another navigation across the side, they see navigation, and then they go, this site doesn't have what I want. They're, right. they're done already. You haven't caught their attention already, so then you're done. All right. I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Um, oh, you get Yeah. Yeah, you got to turn it off. Um, again, you know, one, one, uh, one law of web design is anything you add to a page or to a site um, has the potential to distract the attention from the other stuff on the site. You know, that's one of the reasons that Ling's cars is so bad. There's so much going on that you can't focus on any one thing. There's too much going on. Now, you could go to the opposite, opposite extreme, too. You know, you could have a web page that on every web page there's like one sentence, all right, and very simple. And that's probably, again, an overkill with simplicity, in which case, again, you, you want to move it a little more towards the center, all right. I will say, though, the mistake most web developers make is making things too complicated as opposed to making things too simple, all right want to show off your skills. Exactly. It's fun to do. I am guessing the person that developed this had a blast. Especially with this. <laughs> All right, the, the little shaking your head navigation and these little things going and the cat that's shaking their head and all that. That was probably a lot of fun to do. And you know what? It's even fun for me to visit it the first time. All right? But you know what? If I had to go back to that site over and over again, pretty soon I'd be really, real quickly, I'd be, I'd be sick of, of the, the blinking arrows and, and all that. In fact, if I even really had to find something on that site, even the first time I probably would get, get sick of it. It's not achieving its goal. Right, exactly. You're not, you know, you're just, you're, they're just throwing so many things at the user and saying, find what you want here. All right? That, again, is sort of the mindset of if five things on a page are good, then 50 will be fantastic. It doesn't work that way. All right? It doesn't work that way because if only five of those things are really the important things, then those other 45 things are distracting the user from those five things. So it's not, not good. What's another aspect of good navigation? We talked about um, having consistency. We talked about 
uh, multiple ways of uh, accessing the same information. Can anyone think of anything else? I don't know if this is one, but you know how they have the tabs at the top usually? Mm -hmm. You have to go by the path. You know, I just scroll down, you have to go to the left. Okay. That's yeah, make it, make it, uh, um, make it so that it can be accessed like without scrolling, right. I would say. In general, especially horizontal scrolling is bad. Uh, vertical scrolling, if you have a long article and you have to scroll to get to the bottom of the article, that's not quite so bad. But again, I would try to have the navigation on, on the top part so no scrolling is required. Maybe uh, letting the user know where they're through, like right from. Ah, letting the user know where they're at and, and how they got there. All right. Breadcrumbs, again, are where you list the path that the user took to get to that site. Or, or not that site, but that page. Now that can be tricky if there's multiple ways of navigation. All right, so that's one, one uh, downside of it. But, for example, and I know the screen isn't on, All right, here is Tay Jeweler's website. And what I did is I came to their home page and I clicked on engagement rings. I clicked on Leo diamonds, whatever those are. And I clicked on solitaires. All right, notice what it's showing me. Home, engagement rings, Leo diamonds, solitaires. So at any point, I can easily go back like somewhere in 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 figure. It's like in other words, I look at these and say, oh, I don't like those. I don't like any of these. Let me look for more engagement rings. All right, I can boom go back there and and look at the other item, and so on. So those are called breadcrumbs. You know, in honor of of Hansel and Gretel who threw breadcrumbs down on their path whenever they did whatever they did. It's amazing how you remember parts of those stories but you can't remember the rest of them. I have no idea what Hansel and Gretel were doing in the woods but I do know they threw breadcrumbs down to to uh, find their path back. All right, Which doesn't seem like a good strategy. I don't know. I, I do have to realize this is pre-GPS but still. I mean it seems like there'd be a better better way to handle that. All right, at any rate, the breadcrumbs show the user where they are and how they got there. All right, I've heard someone define navigation as good navigation shows the user where they are, how they got there, where they were before, and where else they can go. All right, breadcrumbs are one great example of, of how to do that because you, you sort of give the path of how they got there. Another good technique that you can use is to have a different style for visited links versus links that they haven't visited yet. Let's go in and let's look at let's look at my photography page. can see this here. Notice that two of the links are one color, two of the links are another color. Why are those different colors? Well, because two of the links I visited, the other two links I haven't visited. The bottom two I visited, the top two I have. Now, those are just the default colors. The default colors for links are blue. The default color for visited links is that kind of magenta. But through my CSS, I can make them anything I want. <clears throat> um, I can even make it, besides different colors, I can make it different style. So for example, I'll just quickly change this. I could say a color 
red a colon visited color you know what that's a colon yes I'm going to actually switch them. I'm going to make green for go, meaning I haven't visited yet. All right. All right. So notice now the red ones are visited, the green ones are not visited. And I can do other things too. I can make the visited ones smaller if I wanted to. And the not visited ones a little bit bigger. All right, so now the ones that aren't visited are slightly bigger than the ones that were visited. So there's a lot of things you can do, but again, that points to places they've been before. So, if you think about it, how does that help users achieve their goals? Well, if they're looking for a piece of information and they haven't found it yet, and they see a link that they've been to before, they know, well, gee, there's no need to go to that again, right? And again, even uh, if that link appears elsewhere, you know, because again, you might have multiple ways to gain to the same content. That link will always show as a visited link and, and you, can do, uh, you can do that. Plus, the breadcrumbs help the user uh, go through that. Any more thoughts on navigation before we continue? All right. Um, the one last thing I will say is, is use clear language. And use clear language from the perspective of the user, not from the perspective of the organization. All right. It's amazing sometimes how you'll see a web page that's broken down like by the same way that the organization breaks down their organization. All right? You know, this department and that department and that department. Well, me as a customer of that, I don't know how, they, how their organization is set up. Now, that kind of structure makes perfect sense for the employees of the site. But the employees of the site are probably not the customers, are probably not the, the users that are visiting that site. Therefore, use a terminology that the outside world is going to understand. Yes? Uh -huh. Um, right, the student talked about doing a website for Goodwill and uh, working on that with them and they wanted to showcase a lot of things about their organization, which may be great things, but aren't of particular interest to people outside who just want to know like where their stores are located, what time is there, and all that. So again, always view it from the user perspective. And that's true when you're developing navigation and that's true uh, otherwise as well. Uh, one small example of this is um, here at, here at LC, um, there are, quote, computer classes in a bunch of different divisions, all right? If you wanted, let's say you were a kid coming out of high school and you were interested in computer programming. You did some work with computers in high school and you thought, this is great, I want to do, I want to study this more. Now, there are courses in the business division for it. There are courses in the, in the engineering division for it. There's even courses in math and science, and there may be even some sort of courses in arts and humanities uh, that deal with some things. So, if our site was geared around our divisions, 
a student would have to know there's courses here, there's courses here, there's courses here, there's courses here. So there actually was a page created that took all of our IT offerings and put them in one place so that people could go and look for it. And regardless of the division that it was offered in, people could, could find it and compare and, and get a more comprehensive view. That's what I mean. For me, it's obvious. Yeah, the business division has, covers this territory. Arts and Humanities covers this territory. But that's because I work here. All right? For people in the outside world, it's not going to be that obvious. Therefore, you need to take that perspective. All right. So our two big things that we had so far is not having clutter not having too much, having good navigation, which is consistent, multiple ways, clear, and so on. What are some other ideas as far as a well-designed website? Well, one would be legibility. This is a case where, you know, some of these things, and when I mention them, people kind of scratch their heads and say, you know, gee, why would you even bother to mention that? You know, isn't that obvious? Isn't that just common sense? Well, uh, one of my observations is that, you know, common sense is not necessarily all that common. <laughs> all right? Uh, it's probably the, one of the most misnamed attributes that I can think of, all right? It is true that you would think that legibility would be um, common sense and it wouldn't be worth mentioning until you go to sites that are not legible, that are very difficult to read. Now, clutter and white space is one way that we can make our sites easier to read. What are some other ways that we can make our sites easier to read? Picking the right color font, picking the right, specifically besides the right color font, the right color contrast between the background and the foreground. All right? Um, high contrast is more readable than low contrast. So, for example, if I had yellow text on an orange background, it's going to be very hard to read. What's probably the easiest combination to read? Black text on a white background. No, 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 no. Yeah, that's right. Black text on a white background. Actually, the reverse is pretty readable, too. White text on a black background. Uh, the eye kind of fatigues a little bit more with that combination, though. So if you have a lot of stuff to read, um, then, then, um, then, then it might be better to, to do the, the, the dark text on a light background instead of the other way around. But again, the contrast is the key. All right, the contrast is the key, and make sure there's sufficient contrast. So, if you have a dark blue on a white background, yeah, that's probably pretty good, too. All right. Um, so the color of the font comes into play, and specifically the contrast between the foreground and the background um, is what is important. What are some other things that affect the, the legibility? The size of the font. All right. Real tiny font is hard for people to read. And for some people, it's harder to read for others. All right, so the size of the font. All right, well, something else that affects legibility. Well, yeah, spelling and grammar, uh, I suppose, affect legibility. Um, it affects people understanding that because, you know, the reason that we have grammar and spelling is so that people understand exactly what you're trying to say instead of having to guess with that. Um, yes. Yeah, the actual font face that you use. In other words, there's some fonts that are easier to read than others. All right, and we talked a little bit about this, how for bigger type, serif fonts are typically used. Well, for smaller type, like the body of text, sans serif fonts are, are, are used. Now, one thing that we're going to talk about at some point uh, in the course, probably a couple weeks into the future, I don't remember exactly what the schedule is, is accessibility. And if you think about accessibility, keep in mind there's, there's people with all sorts of abilities and disabilities accessing your site. And fonts are one of the things that 
can be problematic. All right? Because you have people that don't have great vision. All right? Whether they uh, simply have some, uh, some problem with their vision or maybe they're just an older person that their, their vision has been diminished. All right? So that's one issue. Another issue is people can be colorblind. So the, the font combination, the color combination you choose can be uh, important. All right? In addition, how you use color is important. For example, if you have some text that's really important and you think I'm going to put it in red because it's really important, people that are colorblind might miss that, depending on the specific kind of colorblindness they have. All right? You also have people that are dyslexic which means that sometimes they confuse letters, or, uh, you know, letters around and sometimes they invert letters and sometimes they confuse a, a B for a D, for example, and so on. I just read an article about, or a little blurb, about someone that designed a font specifically to make it easier for dyslexics to read. Um, yeah, no, it's kind of an interesting thing um, to, to see because they've taken the characteristics and the things, you know, the, the things that make it hard for a dyslexic to read it and, and they've design the font to, 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 to counterbalance that. All right. Um, so all these things taken together, you know, the, 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 the clutter, the white space, the font color choice, the font face choice, all these things can affect the, the, the legibility. Um, it's possible sometimes to allow the user to choose the color scheme and the font scheme. All right. Let me bring up a site that does that. This is actually a school for the blind and a school for people that have visual problems. And you can go and you can customize your view a couple different ways. Notice how the navigation is changing as I change the color. Now, that's a nice feature that you can offer because, uh, again, um, you can go in and you can click the different color schemes. And if someone isn't completely blind, but someone just has impaired vision or some form of color blindness, doing this can uh, can really assist them in being able to read the site. Now, this is an advanced technique. All right. Um, just as sort of a side note, you can do things like this, all right, when you have a very clean separation between your CSS and HTML. Because it's the same HTML, right? What gets changed is the CSS. So when you click on one thing, they get one CSS. When you click on another thing, they get another CSS. So um, if you develop in that way and having a clean separation between all of them, Again, you can be very effective as far as, as doing that. All right, so um, we have a few more thoughts about design, a few more things to wrap up, and then I want to talk about the project. So that's what we'll do first lecture next week. Uh, after that, we will get on to uh, more CSS. All right, see you over in lab.